Welcome back after lunch. So the first one we have today is a in this session on professional development. I was, oh, hang on. We'll just have a couple of questions after each session and then invite you to talk to all presenters and we'll try and bring together some topics that everybody can discuss at the end of the sessions as well. And finally, I'm going to ask um, Susan Richardson and Joe Dargouche, along with others, but I don't see, have we got Lois and Robert present? No, um, Delmo, it's just myself and Susan today. Yep. They're going to be talking about um, transitioning from vet into higher education. So this is about students in particular transitioning one to the other. And I presume we'll talk about things that academics can also do to improve that transition. Thanks, Delma. Yes, along those lines. Um, but before we start, I'd just like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and learn. And for those of us in Noosa, that's the Gubby Gubby or Cubby Cubby people. And I pay my respects to the First Nations people and their elders past, present and future. Um, so yes, I am, uh, well, I'm beginning our session today and I'll also introduce Susan Richardson, who is another team member who will also be speaking today. She'll be doing the more interesting stuff, which is, you know, around um, some some early sorts of findings from our project. So yes, um, we are talking uh, under the banner of professional development of educators today, um, but we're speaking specifically about a research project that we've been involved with um, that is designed, I suppose, to lead to the professional development of educators, but hopefully you'll find something interesting um, for your own practice in what we talk about today. Um, so when I talk about our project, I'm talking specifically about something that is occurring as a result of the particular context in which we find ourselves all working at the moment. Uh, and that is the, um, uh, this, the landscape that finds us purposefully uh, opening the doors of our universities up to more diverse students. So since the Bradley Review in 2008, um, and that focus on increasing university participation and widening participation, um, it's a very positive thing that we are now having um, students sitting in front of us who perhaps in the past may not have had an opportunity to get to university and who are being supported in, in the work that they're doing there. Um, it's a key focus now for all universities uh, and, and our institution in particular, for those of us from CQU, we, we'd already know this, our institution actually is, is really quite successful in recruiting diverse learners as well. And we are spread obviously across the country and that, that enables um, that also. Um, what we are seeing though, as a result of that, is that there is um, increasing student non-completion rates. Well, those, these aren't alarming, they, they are there. And there's also an increased emphasis on online study as well. So those factors are all kind of shaping um, the landscape in which we're working. Um, one thing to mention there, I guess, with that increased uh, student diversity and increased participation comes um, a higher attrition rate, particularly for our university. We have a, in 2016, we had a 23.15% attrition rate. And um, even though we don't want to be up this end of the league's table, it was the second highest in Queensland. Uh, that's not a positive for us, but it's one of the things that fits into our context. <laughs> Increasingly, we're also enrolling as part of the, the diversity push, we are actually enrolling students from um, diverse backgrounds who may not actually have the, the academic background that, that might be optimal for coming into university. So increasingly, we're seeing vet entry students. Um, you can see that that stat up there on the slide um, between 2010 and 2002, 2018, 4,941 students came in with a VET entry background. Now that is split between students who got credits as a result of those VET qualifications and students who didn't, who merely presented and that was their, 
their, um, you know, the thing that enabled them to enrol. Now, we know that the period of transition into university for a range of students can be problematic, uh, and it's not necessarily restricted to um, vet entry students. However, for vet entry students, there is some emerging research that's saying that there are actually challenges. And these are in relation to the differences in teaching, learning and assessment that occur between um, the competency-based education system of vet and the higher ed system. We're, we're asking students who come in to do quite different things in relation to their learning and the way that they're assessed and the way that um, you know, they're able to show evidence of their learning. And there are some studies out there who are, that are indicating that there is poorer retention and academic outcomes for some of the students in this vet entry group, not all of them, but um, you know, in relation, well, in comparison with students from more traditional pathways, it can be seen for some students that this is, um, you know, it's a little more problematic. So some questions that were emerging for us were things around how such students can be successful in higher ed and what assists them to be successful in higher ed. So those two questions are what we then took into uh, our shaping of a project to investigate the experiences of students in our own institution. So this is our Smoothing Assessment Transitions for VET Students project and we do love a good acronym in education so that was our latest and this is a HEP funded project. Now those of you who have worked in the HEP um, area understand that high, the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships project is um, a federal government funded uh, body of money that comes into our institution and it's then allocated to projects to assist low SES learners in particular. However, in doing that, we also, I guess, address the needs of a whole range of diverse learners and learners with other sorts of equity markers. And it's interesting to know about our own institution that a third of our students are low SES and that 20% of all of the students in our institution are low SES students who are studying in distance mode. So students who perhaps don't come from a traditional background, who perhaps don't have other people around them in their families who, who have studied before are also studying at a distance from us too. Of the 90% of our low SES cohort in term two of this year, um, not sorry, of the of the entire student cohort in term two of this year in undergrad courses, 90% were regional remote as well. Um, so we're looking at students with particular needs. So what we wanted to do in our project was we wanted to investigate how to better support our vet entry students who are transitioning into higher education, particularly in relation to the pedagogies and the assessment practices that we use to support them. And then we wanted to be able to look at that research to help to inform learning and teaching and assessment and other practices in our own institution. So the idea was that the, the way to find out, I guess, about our students was to be able to uh, get student voice data. And this comes on the back of a, another HEP project that um, another one of our team and I had completed a couple of years ago, which was really looking at first year low SES students. But um, digging down into this particular group our, at this time, our VET students. So our investigation uh, was mixed methods project and in stage one we actually looked at all of the existing archival data um, the demographic and achievement data of vet entry students from 2010 to 2018 so we wanted to see who they were what courses they were in um, how successful they were um, in their GPA for first year. Uh, for those who'd been in the system for a while, whether they completed, we wanted to get that complete picture of who these people were. Then in stage two, we wanted to identify existing institutional supports that we have here. We want to be able to see what we do uh, to actually support these students in particular. And we wanted to look at research outside of our institution to see what other institutions did and identify good practice models at other institutions. So we get that big picture then of, 
of how how do other people go about supporting their students and our stage three was our student voice data and we have i think about 110 surveys complete surveys and uh, we have completed 20 interviews with um, low SES students. Sorry, that is really <laughs> annoying. Um, and so we now have a, a lot of quantitative data and a lot of qualitative data. And the next um, step to all of this is the recommendations for practice that we have um, uh, been asked to deliver. Uh, we want to suggest ways of supporting the students and we'll be looking at, you know, university-wide practices, practices within courses and schools as well, and then at the level of teaching within units. How do we best go about actually um, supporting these students? And now I'm going to hand over to Susan, who's going to talk about some of our early sorts of findings from the data. Thanks, Thanks Joe. As you can imagine, um, in sourcing uh, student voice data, we have an enormous amount of rich data to sift through. And for the purposes of today's presentation, I've just tried to distill the student voice uh, into a form that gives you a sense of the type of key themes that are emerging from the data and the, the themes that are um, coming through in the stories that the students share with us. So the students who have participated in our, in our interviews are studying towards bachelor qualifications across a range of discipline areas. So we've got accounting, nursing, social work, business, education. And the students have transitioned from vet to higher education because they see that the higher degree qualification is an entry point into career enhancement, into job satisfaction, and quite simply as a way to pursue something that they've always wanted to do. So we can identify a positive motivation to undertake the study. There's also a sense of hopeful confidence that their success at diploma level bodes well for success at the higher education level. And most students described a feeling that they don't know really what they don't know, but there's a sense of how much harder can it actually be? I've been successful in the diploma arena. I've um, done well there. So it won't be too hard transitioning to higher ed. Once enrolled, however, and that's presuming that the students could actually manage the often unwieldy navigational access demands of our university systems. And once they've engaged with Moodle and the particular requirements of their units of, our of their study, our project participants actually then noted similar issues, similar concerns, similar points of frustration. And those points of concern and frustration are encapsulated in the composite student commentary that we've presented on the screen. And I'd like you just to take a moment to read through it, if you would. So that's in the large yellow, fluoro yellow rectangle. That commentary highlights the themes that emerged through our interview data. Students transitioning from vet through to higher ed, particularly those who had received credits from their prior study in the diploma level, stated very emphatically that they wanted uni university support mechanisms and lecturers in particular to know who they were as individual students in terms of the challenges faced juggling life's commitments alongside their study commitments. They wanted to be very clearly identified as transitioning students, highlighting the issues that they might experience as they navigated their way through the first term of their study at university level. Students identified that they really had not been aware of the real differences between the educational sectors, citing the increased demands from assessment tasks, reading lists for writing conventions, for referencing, for the navigation of Moodle sites, and just-in-time information changes made by lecturers to be sources of frustration, 
angst, stress, and at times, even for failed grades on assessment items. It seemed that many students actually tripped over key information relevant to their study needs, that often the navigation of Moodle site materials was inconsistent, the information inaccurate or changed without notice, that access to ALC and other university support mechanisms whilst encouraged was not actually described in ways for them that made the access easy and or timely. There appears to be some premise that transitioning VET students intuitively understand the technology, the systems and the computer literacy demands. Students noted that course advice, access to counsellors, access to the full range of university support mechanisms, whilst again available, is not always accurately conveyed to them. Life often gets in the way, Time management is a constant challenge for all students, but especially for these students transitioning from the relatively manageable demands of the diploma to what they find to be much more taxing demands of higher ed. The participants in our interviews noted very strongly that supportive networks were critical to successful study outcomes. Many suggested that it was the connections with other students and working with other students that facilitated a pathway that navigated both content and assessment tasks. As well, and not surprisingly, positive relationships with lecturers was another key to study success. Students identified the characteristics of those lecturers with whom they had built a sense of academic trust. Commonly, they described the characteristics through describing engaged teaching practices, saying that assessment tasks were well scaffolded, that Moodle tasks were well constructed and easy to navigate, that there was clear communication with the lecturer and a warm, genuine lecturer interest in the students and a willingness to, to provide additional support. And they identified these characteristics as critical pillars for their academic success. So between that composite student commentary and what I've just described there, you can see that we've identified some emerging themes. Knowing the students, relationships and connectedness, articulating the actual differences to students about the differences between VET and higher ed, time and actually again articulating to them the demands that would be placed on their time and also ac access to accurate study information and that's at a systemic at a unit at a moodle and also at a, a lecturer to student um, basis as well and so they're the themes so what are the key messages in terms of the recommendations that joe um, foregrounded was the purpose of our study. We think at the moment, in a preliminary sense, there are four key messages for the university and for lecturers and for the practice with which lecturers engage. We must acknowledge the group of VET students transitioning, transitioning to higher ed and identify their specific collective study needs. We need to design and deliver short purposeful orientation and or information sessions that work through key aspects of study and study support mechanisms relevant to individual courses. There was a clear um, disin disconnect with the generic information presented. It, orientation was often described as being overwhelming, too much information and again, um, point in time information was considered to be more relevant. We need to create a specific support study group for transitioning VET students. They want to belong and they want to belong to a group of like-minded people. And we need to redevelop Moodle sites to better reflect a consistent navigational and pedagogical approach to study and assessment materials. So our, uh, our beginning question, how hard can it be to transition from VET to higher education? We acknowledge that all students are uniquely different and they come with different dispositions, 
different capacities to study and different support net networks. And so that transition is manageable for a few. It's hard for many and it is really hard for some of them. So thank you for listening to our presentation today. We hope there's food for thought there. And as we move further into our study and decide upon our specific recommendations, hopefully those recommendations can tran uh, transfer into um, a practice with which we can engage. Thank you so much, Delma. Thanks, Jo. Thanks, Susan and Jo. Does anybody have a question for... Susan or Joe this afternoon? I'll just get you to stop sharing, please, Joe. Okay, in the absence of anybody else. Um, what I've heard, Susan, is that perhaps we need a transition program. What would you suggest for that type of thing? Well, there are many components to it. Um, Delma, it's, um, it's not just a point of having more information for them. It's about actually recognising and articulating what the students are telling us in terms of their needs as a group of students and then addressing those needs in very explicit, specific ways. So one of the ideas we've had, for example, was um, very specific online and face-to-face -face orientation sessions, but not just one, like rolling sessions that occur prior to the term starting and continue on through the term. It's about having purposefully designed information sessions, but as well as that, Delma, we need to have ongoing mechanisms that keep checking in, that keep offering support. A clear message to us through the interviews was, don't just enrol us and put us into second year uh, units when really we're first year students and lecturers expect we know everything. Don't do that to us know who we are, know our stories and respond. So that's a long-winded answer, Delma, but it's, it's quite a complex uh, issue to find the ways that we think we can best support them. And Joe, you might want to jump in there. Um, yeah, thanks, Susan. Uh, actually, Robert and I, one of our other team members, were having a look at some of the survey data this morning. And while I won't preempt because we were just having an initial sort of look, you know, that it seems like some of these students are saying that at this point in time, they actually rely on help from family and friends a little bit more than they do um, on those mechanisms that are supplied by the university at this point in time to really understand what it is they've got to do. So I think that's one of the things that we have to consider you know, what, what sort of information is it that they really need? How can we put it in place? How can we pin it to what they're doing, embed it to a, in what they're doing in order to, to better support them. But um, Delma, we, we will actually have a lot, um, uh, when, when we get to the end of the project, one of the things that we will be doing obviously is, is sharing some of the things that we would recommend around this data. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, sorry, is it Susan or Joe? Sorry, Sarah. S -A -R -R. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to pop in here and say that um, at my university, USC, we have introduced a, um, a first year, first semester course, which is totally devoted on showing first year, first semester students our way or one way of writing essays, or one way of structuring a report and one way of presenting you know, to the three assessments we have. Part of our presentation each week includes slides that are thrown in that talk about drop-ins, talk about different aspects of support that the university is giving the students. Because as you say, overload, there's so much stuff. Now we've been doing this since 2009, I think, uh, quite a few years now, and is now a mandatory course at the university at the moment. But students are still finding it's overload. So it's, it's 
we can still tell them, but they still have to accept. They still need to find, the, you know, the time poor people need to find the time to sift through which version suits them. We've got so much information online for the different kinds of students. Those who learn by doing, those who learn by listening, blah, blah, blah. So we've, the, the team has produced so much material that in the end, I think we've killed ourselves in that we've overdone it. You know, we've developed and developed and changed. One good thing is a lot of the stuff I'm hearing today has been incorporated into that course. The actual coordinators listen and they work on, on the results of a lot of their studies and it's really fabulous. So I found it particularly interesting to hear what you all have to say about this study. It seems to fit in so nicely with what we're doing at USC. Thank you. Just a comment. Thank, thank, thank you, you. Sorry, very much. Sorry. Could I just respond to that too? I think that what you're talking about is, is um, one of the issues. We, we have the Academic Learning Centre here and the Academic Learning Centre provides an awful lot of support for students. We actually think that the next step might be self-assessment tools for students so that they can determine what their needs are, you know, and they can choose to access then. As you said, you know, there's a lot of information there. Um, so that's one of the things that we will be looking at very much is, you know, how could we possibly get them to do do that work about determining their own needs first before they, they you know, then have to go to that next stage. Joe? Um, really quick question, Matt. Um, oh, just a comment. Um, I've been involved in some CQU Renew conversations in which diagnostic testing has been talked about in terms of the first year uh, common unit. What's interesting is that that would skip students who were um, brought in on a second year because they've been doing some vet work. They would they'd get skipped in that diagnostic testing. Thank you. That, that is an interesting comment, Matt. And I think we need to really consider whether some of those foundation units might be necessary for vet students to help them transition. So when they're written, we need to go back and have the discussion with Sue and Joe. And, and Faye looks like she's really keen to have the discussion as well because I can see her nodding along. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I the second one. Yeah, I I just sort of jump in there because again we've seen the same exactly the same thing with students coming from those other pathways. The thing is, we think we're doing the right thing for them by allowing them to skip some units, but the trouble is, there's all this amazing other sort of perhaps information and knowledge that we we don't even realise we're necessarily um, giving in those early units that really help the student to to make the transition. And when we give them credit, they skip those units. So it, it, it's it's a major issue as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the whole thing around credit transfer and yeah, because uh, I think the trouble is we, as I say, we think we're helping the student and maybe we're actually disadvantaging them. I'm also wondering whether the proposed eight weeks to uni course, which is now going to be called something else, um, wondering whether that needs to be adapted for these. And I know Sandy McClellan's stand, sitting there, and I know she, we've had these conversations before, Sandy, about preparation for diploma students. Very much so. And I do know when we're writing the new curriculum, there is some talk of having some mandatory units that the enrolled nurses will need to do who are transitioning over that we're hoping to have them mandatory, but there's still discussion going on with Josh about that. Um, but it sounds like it's just going to be get them up to speed because it's it, there's a huge hole there. Um, as I think it was Faye was saying, are we advantaging them or not? Because we're setting them up to fail in a lot of cases. Okay, I'll call it, stop that now and we'll come back at the end of the other two presentations. The next presentation is coming from Alice Springs. And I'm not sure, but I think Alice Springs is a half an hour in front of us. So we're crossing time zones here quite rapidly. And this is a digital literacy program for staff called 23 Things. And I'm going to be really interested to see how this is. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Wendy Tellio, and I'm co-presenting with Sue Tucker about 23 Things. So if you can just give me a thumbs up if you can hear. Great, thank you. So 23 Things is a digital literacy program for professional development. Uh, Sue and I are the main facilitators and uh, we're going to go through 
uh, the design process, why open, uh, give you a demo of the site. Uh, so we've already had a recognition of traditional owners and I'd just like to add to that that we're on Aranda country and uh, we extend the respect uh, to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So the design process for 23 things, uh, it, sometimes we call it 23 digital things to make it clear that we're talking about digital literacy. Uh, we call it 23 things at, at CDU, at Charles Darwin University. Uh, and we use the term 23 things because uh, it's a thing. It's something that other universities have uh, completed for digital literacy reasons. So we've got a WordPress site and Sue will talk more about uh, why we chose WordPress. Uh, and we've uh, tried other methods of professional development uh, for all different reasons. I'm a learning technologist and I work in the field of looking after the learning management system and training staff in that area. Um, but this time we didn't want to reinvent the wheel or have to write things from scratch. So we reviewed other versions of 23 Things, including the Library Association of Ireland, the University of Edinburgh and Charles Sturt University. There is more universities that have run 23 things, but we found these three to be most uh, closely aligned to what we were wanting to aim at. And the beauty of 23 things is it's openly licensed. So we were able to uh, use the material already there. We agreed on using unsplash.com for feature images uh, because it was ease of use, we could access it uh, and all the images are openly licensed. We could uh, crop them or change them. And so the image that you see there of someone holding the mobile phone is our chosen sort of banner image. And then each week we've used an unsplash.com image. Uh, so to start the design process, we chose or composed a big list by looking at the other three sort of sister sites, if you like. We wrote a, a large list of things that could be covered for digital literacy. And then we shared that with uh, staff and asked for feedback to finalise this list and added in some extra uh, ones that were pertinent to our own cohort, but we're always conscious that we're, we're writing this not just for Charles Darwin University staff, uh, but we're writing it for an open cohort and writing it so that people at many different levels uh, could access it. So why open? Uh, in this image where we're the, we're the dog. We're sitting on the wall trying to show people uh, what's past the brick wall and closed systems. So we have completed uh, professional development behind the brick wall in the wiki, in the uh, learning management system for staff. And this time we wanted to reach past that um, because both of us have benefited from other open sourced professional development and continue to do so on platforms like Twitter. Um, but in this case, particularly because we were writing 23 things and using material that said, okay, you need to produce it and make it available uh, in a Creative Commons licensing. We felt that going open would reach a wide audience that would include VET and higher ed. Uh, in particular because Charles Darwin University is a dual sector university. So we already had that in our target group, uh, but also research and all staff levels. So professional or academic uh, people could hook in 
to this professional development. Um, part of the digital literacy story is learning about the open web. So we felt that by producing this in an open manner, it was um, part of learning for our own digital literacy, but sharing with others uh, how that would work. Uh, communication and, and collaboration is also part of digital literacy. And we wanted this uh, to be encouraged both within the university, but more widely. So by having an open website, we could uh, connect with people in our own uh, networks. So for example, that would include our professional learning networks, special interest groups uh, that we are part of. Uh, Sue and I are both part of the Teleadvisors Ascolite special interest group, and I'm a SIG leader for that and other organisations like ALT, the Association of Learning Technologists in the UK, um, who many of their members are familiar with 23 things that have been run in that environment. So the next thing that we had to do was to look at what choices we had for platforms. So I'm going to hand over to Sue and we'll just do a quick change of headphones and she'll talk about that. Thanks Wendy. So Wendy and I work closely together, although we're in slightly different teams. My role is our professional development of our VET staff and also supporting them with a lot of the compliance um, and accreditation work that they do. Um, so to work with staff on a program like this has actually been very exciting and to work together has been fantastic. So we had to choose uh, a platform. Um, we didn't want it to be internal, as Wendy said. So we then had to look at what options we had for an open platform. And we were offered the option of WordPress. Um, in the end, it, it actually probably wasn't our choice. It was WordPress is the platform that CDU approved. Um, so it allows, we were very happy with that. It allows for um, participation from people both within and outside the university. Because it's a, un it's a system that we already use uh, for other departments at the university, we already have the license. So there was no extra cost to our individual department, um, which was something that our managers were very happy with. Um, it also meant that we had access to uh, our in-house web developers and they were able to support us through choosing a particular template, um, quite a daunting process because there are so many templates available. So we were influenced there by other iterations of 23 Things. We looked at what their websites looked like and eventually selected um, a few options, which we then presented to our web developers, really with a, a very broad brief of, we'd like something like this. And they came up with uh, the template that we're now using and provided us with the, the initial training um, to be able to then edit and create our individual week by week posts. So this particular template has um, a content item which it calls portfolio. And that's what allows us to produce the week by week blocks that you can see on screen there. Um, so they're not actually blog posts, which was what we initially thought we would be writing. Having this platform also allows us to write in a very variety of different styles, although Wendy and I are the, the two main facilitators. For some of the weekly things, we have outsourced them to uh, specialists. Um, one of our colleagues had a, a previous life as a professional photographer. So he's written two of the things. Um, about particularly using images and image banks. And we also outsourced another one to another colleague who's very experienced in using OneNote. So um, it's very much a, a shared um, team effort. So what does it look like? Well, you can see the front page there. And we'll now just take you to um, some screenshots. And 
I think we've got a few minutes so I can actually share with you, um, take you to the website and, and show you what that looks like. So what you've got there on screen at the moment is uh, starting top left, that's our homepage. Uh, you can see a, um, two modified versions of that banner image that Wendy was talking about. We've then got a page that we call our list of things, uh, which simply gives a, a view of what's already been and what's coming up. And those items that have already been released, that page contains a link. We have an about page. So this includes uh, a whole page of FAQs. It includes our reference sites uh, and our licensing agreements and also links back to the other our sister sites, the other um, iterations of 23 things on which ours is partially based. And then finally, each thing has its own page. So let me take you across there. Just bear with me while I drag this across. I'm not on my computer, so Wendy might give me some directions. There we go. So this is uh, thing one. We've kept each thing with a similar uh, style and a similar template. So in each thing, we have an introduction, uh, which really just describes what this thing is about. Following from the introduction, we have a section called more detail, and that's what might be the, the body or the main content of the particular thing. Uh, sometimes this is longer than others, depending on, on what the topic is for that thing. We then give some activities. So this being thing one, we wanted to encourage people to do a, a personal analysis, um, a, a digital profile. And we've previously used the All Aboard um, program, which has come from Ireland and categorizes your skills. You go through and you answer some questions and you come up with a, a profile that you can see there in the pie chart. Um, we're encouraging people to do this at the beginning uh, when they first start with 23 Things and then to do it again periodically um, through the series so that they can refer back and see how they're going. Uh, finally, then we have a, an area of sharing where we ask people to um, engage with us um, just by writing some comments and you can see that there. So let me just find you. So this is our FAQ or our about page. Um, here we have our, our range of questions. Um, who can take part? Do they get recognition? Um, do they have to have a blog to participate? We do encourage people to blog as they progress through the, the program, um, but it's certainly not a necessity. Our list of things. And we started this in May, as you can see, and just bear with me as I scroll. We're up to October thing 18, um, thing 17 was released, uh, thing 18 was released last week. Um, so we've had just had two things on social media and we're about to go into uh, copyright and evaluating information and our homepage uh, back again there. So um, that's a very, very quick tour of 23 things. Um, thank you for listening. There's a couple of ways there that you can connect with us. And um, we'd love other people to join in um, because it's still a thing that's happening. We don't have any data yet on, or any firm data on participation rates, um, anything like that. But um, hopefully that will come and, and hopefully we might get some sort of presentation out of that uh, later. Uh, but in the meantime, connect with us on 23 things, jump in and try any of them if they're of interest and connect with us on Twitter. And that's uh, our Twitter uh, account there. We'd love to see you on board. Thanks, Wendy and Sue. I've already flicked over to the website and had a look at it. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, T has a question. Oh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, with the 23 things there, um, every year you will change the things or they always there and fixed there? Yeah, so we actually haven't made that decision yet. At this stage, the site will remain. So once we get, get to thing 23, 
the site will stay there. We've made a, um, a commitment that we will facilitate the site up until the end of October, and then the site will remain. When we come to next year, we, we need to review our data and our participation and whether we amend this site or whether we start a new 23 things, we haven't made that decision yet. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Wendy, Susan? Oh. Susan, um, go ahead. Thank you, Delma. Um, so with the 23 things, if I go into the website, I can just um, connect with and log into a thing that is of interest to me. I don't have to work my way through in a linear process in the form of modules. I can just click in and out as need be. That's right, Susan. It It's recommended to start with thing one, uh, but after that, uh, you're welcome to pick and choose because we recognise that people have different levels of digital literacy in different areas. So you might immediately recognise you know, thing five as something that you want to uh, spend some time on. So our motto is spend a little time each week to improve your digital literacy. And that could be in any of those areas. Thank you very much for the lovely presentation. Thank you, very interesting. Thanks, Susan. Wendy, Susan, a question please. Um, yes. Going back to the, uh, that lovely slide you had with that cute little doggy standing in front of the wall. Yes. Um, uh, in academic development, it's always a matter of uh, trying to get people to do what you're doing. In other words, uh, academic staff are bombarded with all sorts of different things. I know you don't have hard data yet, but I was wondering if you had any anecdotal data about um, things that draw people to your site, things that, um, why people come to your site, what, the, what, what, what draws them to engage. So we, we don't have any anecdotal data on what's drawing them to the site. Uh, you will see at the bottom of some things, there's comments there. Uh, and, you know, some things have more comments than others. We've also had interactions in Twitter. So um, we see that people would follow our Twitter account or interact with us on Twitter. We also have an internal Yammer page and so that's unit just university wide not outside of the university and we've had some interactions on there and we we increased the group on Yammer but that doesn't that's all about the the content so it's all about what are you doing with the thing uh, what's your evidence and our prompts are usually you know share with us your thoughts on that particular area um, and it would be part of, I would, I would like to put that in a, a survey of what would draw people to the site. We've had good uh, feedback on the design of the site and that's mainly been from the education strategy area that we both belong to. Um, sorry, and just the last point is we also recognise lurking as a, a legitimate form of participation. And so there's people that might look at the site and not put a comment. Uh, they might browse the Twitter stream and never participate. So uh, that is that's is what it is. Okay, so we might start with the last session. I'm not sure if you've called this Spicks and Specs, Matt, because you're a fan of quiz shows or a fan of the Bee Gees. But Matt's going to talk to us about the um, tracking of scholarship. Really provocative topic for me to be um, facilitating today. Take it away. Oh, very good. Just got to figure out how to... Oh, I think I can get there. Yes, very good. So, hello, everybody. So, we've had a really interesting session today together. So, if we, we began with a presentation on re academic research, um, which I thought was really great and well and needed. Um, then we had a program or project presentation um, on on the, one of the many ways we try to get education uh, academic staff engaged in learning about technology and teaching with technology. This presentation is a bit different. This presentation is what the social innovation people would call a wicked problem. I'm going to present you with a problem. I'm going to try to um, 
try to talk at talk about it from multiple sides and i invite you from each where you're sitting in in within the institution to think about how you would solve this problem because it's a very interesting one so back in the latter half of 2017 when i was working in learning and teaching services i was approached by my line manager dr uh, julie fleming uh, with a with a problem she said that we have we have a cohort we have a type of uh, employee here called teaching scholars and teaching scholars have 25% of their workload de dedicated to academic scholarship um and she said the deans don't know how to manage the scholarship workload they don't know what quality is they don't know really how to gauge what that academic workload, scholarly workload would look like. They don't know, they wouldn't, they didn't really know how to tell whether someone was making progress in that workload. Um, and so she said, she said, Matt, you've been doing some work on scholarship. So why don't you try to come up with a plan? And so I came up with a plan. And so it's called the annual scholarship plan. And I, I submitted multiple drafts and then it was massaged by, by, different people and improved by different people and it ended up in what we have what we call the academic profiles procedure and so from the beginning it was my intention that this annual scholarship plan would be would do, would do two things first of all it would be about teaching teaching the teaching scholars how to develop a scholarship plan another thing about our um, cohort at that time was that we had a significant number of teaching scholars who didn't really have a strong, strong grasp of what academic scholarship was. And so you'll see there, you know, listing the aims, what activities that they were going to do, what resources they needed, um, and then evidence of success. Um, because the, because, and when I got feedback from teaching scholars at the time, when I showed them drafts in development that they thought it was a great idea. Um, if you still think it's a great idea, uh, I'm the one you can blame for this. So the idea was first it was going to teach you, teach it, the teaching scholars a bit about how to frame a, schol uh, a progression of scholarly activity, and it would give, serve as a point of dialogue between the teaching scholar and the line manager, with the, whoever that was, probably a dean how to have a conversation about academic scholarship and a trajectory of scholarship. And one of the key things to understand about scholarship, academic scholarship is it's a deeply creative act. It's, it's like write, writing a novel, you know? It comes and it goes. Um, you, get, you get inspired and then you try something and you're, you find out it's a dead end, but it might have given you some insights. So you go try something else. And it's, it's a progression toward a landscape, not necessarily a goal, but a landscape to be discovered. So this was the annual scholarship plan 2017. Now at the same time, our university was going undergoing TEXA registration. And Jason Burgess, who headed that project up and is still heading up our, our, our TEXA response, um, was um, doing very strong work and very good work in terms of both pushing back on TEXA to, to clarify what they mean, what they meant by certain things, and to try to figure out how to meet their demands. And, and um, in this guidance note on scholarship, it says several provocative things that I think we need to pay attention to. So section 1.4, um, higher education providers, academic staff, that's us, are active in scholarship that informs their teaching. That's important for us to understand that that is something that our national regulatory body is, is imposing. That your scholarship, whatever it is, is supposed to, it needs to have the outcome of informing your teaching. Section 5, 2.5, the higher education provider demonstra demonstrates sustained scholarship that informs 
learning and teaching and learning in all courses of study. In other words, the onus is put on the university to have evidence that scholarship, a sufficient number, whatever that means, a sufficient amount, or whether it's current or not, whatever that means, is, is performed in each course of study. And then, um, let's see, yes, and then 1.3, um, or yes. Anyway, so this is where we start talking about neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, big social theory, the, the easiest way to understand it is that neoliberalism pushes capitalism to the heart of any activity. Neoliberalism turns whatever that activity is into a product. And so I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read a quote from um, Olson and Peters, who are sociologists of education. The ascendancy of neoliberalism and the asso associated discourses of new public management during the 1980s and 1990s have produced a fundamental shift in the way universities and other institutions of higher education have defined and justified their institutional existence. The tr I love this part. The traditional professional culture of open intellectual inquiry and debate has been replaced with an institutional stress on performativity, strategic planning, performance indicators, quality assurance measures, and academic audits. So as there's a lot of reasons why I love that quote. One is, I remember, I'm an old guy, I remember when there was some of that, that open ac intellectual debate quality to the university. And I graduated from my P from, from PhD program in 2009 in the US. And the university that I was at, they had what they called the faculty senate. And if that faculty senate academic staff pushed back on neoliberalism every chance they got because they valued this whole idea of freedom of scholarship that this this idea that scholarship is this creative act and so now here we have our regulatory body our registration body that, that the university that australia we have to be registered and they are turning academic scholarship into performance indicators. They're saying, we need to see your performance. We need to have evidence of your performance in any, in every course of study. And so this whole neoliberalism idea is that your scholarship is a commodity that can be measured and should be measured. The higher, the higher education provider demonstrates to demonstrate sustained scholarship. It needs to be reported in some way. Now, CQU has to respond to that. And I was involved in some early conversations about the CQU response about scholarship. I really kind of don't want to go there in this presentation because it's been a long time since I've been in any of those conversations. And, and the main point about the C institutional response I, I want to make is that CQU is in a tough spot. Between the open dialogue about teaching scholars and their scholarship and, and the developmental approach to helping people to develop their scholarship, and the need to report data. And so I noticed, like I said, I think Jason's still here, I can't see everybody. Um, and Delma, of course, is also doing some very strong work within the university. But it is a wicked problem. How do we, as an institution, support that for you? Support the idea that someone's scholarship may change and go in a dramatically different direction. And their academic scholarship, their annual scholarship plan um, is suddenly moot. How do we do that? How do we keep that freedom while operating in this neoliberalist um, environment that we're all stuck in? So, I have a keen love of something called structuration theory, and that's 
a whole social theory about how individuals make sense of complex systems. Um, there's a whole bank of different theories about that. Um, uh, one of the key things they talk about is agency. That individuals within a complex system can have a certain sense of freedom. And in a lot of these structure and agency models, the question is how does a person discover their agency? How do they how do they act it out? Can they act it out? Are what are the repercussions? What are the what are the nonverbals that keep people toeing the line? So my last slide here is that as individuals and as community university community members, we can respond to this situation. It's a complex problem. It's a wicked problem. Um, what that response is, who knows? Don't know. What it should be, interesting question. I'd like to hear your ideas about it. One response to this uh, out of feminist theory, feminist pedagogy, is what they call slow scholarship, in which there's, you know, there's a slow scholarship manifesto. There are people who are saying scholarship is slow. And let's let it let's let it emerge as it wants to emerge. Um, I think a key idea there again is the difference between academic scholarship and research. Research is often, not always, often on a timeline based on grants and publication. And scholarship is a bit more flexible than that. There might be some timelines about academic publishing, but not necessarily. It's more of an emergent process. And Margaret Archer, who's, a, who's also a scholar in terms of uh, structure and agency within the university setting, she's a long-term scholar about that. She has three things that, that she suggests that faculty do in the face, of, sorry, I just used the American term, that academic staff do in the face of systems that are not necessarily working for them. In other words, if the tempo of your scholarship is somehow not in alignment with the needs of the university, the real needs of the university, based on our regulatory body. And so um, the first thing that she says is negotiate, is to say, okay, uh, please tell me what the needs are. Let's see how I can do that. Let's go back to that annual scholarship plan and start thinking about about how my tempo, my work, can best serve your needs. The sec second thing that she says is to critique, that we have voices, that we can raise conversations. Critique, I think, sometimes it is, um, it, uh, critique, I think, sometimes is interpreted as being, as being harsh or saying things are wrong. But critique is this often uh, can be just asking questions and saying, is this, the way we, is this the way we want to proceed with this wicked problem? Is this what we want to do? And finally, she says that we should resist. Oops, I should, um, I should be opening up this chat box. Um, it's hard to do that with this. Okay, so um, that we can, act, we can actively resist what does not work for us. Now, I can tell you that I see that all the time. And the place I see it the most is in, with Edna. Edna is a database in which academic staff and maybe professional staff are supposed to, to list their engagement activities. And what I hear, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, that people said, oh, I'm going up, I'm going up for uh, promotion, so I've got about a year's worth of engagement activities to enter. Um, so, so, Ignoring something is is a is a is a um, easy way to resist, but if we don't get the negotiation and the critique, then the university, the institution, doesn't learn. So this is my wicked problem I'm presenting to you. I don't have an answer to it. We have a lot of smart people on this call right now. Um, uh, I saw. Jason, Jason was here. Let me just let me. How do I stop share? I push that button. Um, Delma's here. She's doing active work there. 
lots of smart people here. We have a uh, we have Faye Martin, who's a who's a, a deputy dean of learning and teaching. People who've been around for a long time. Um, questions or comments on the ideas presented presented in this conceptual presentation. Delma, Jason here. Um, that, that's very interesting, Matt, um, what you've, um, interesting discussion. Um, though I don't agree with um, it coming from a neoliberal perspective. Um, I mean, I've, I've jotted down a few points. Uh, Australian universities, when they were first founded, have always been a, had a utilitarian nature to them. Um, and if you have a look at Quinn Davis's the Australian idea of university, he makes that quite clear. Um, many of the drivers, in, since the unitary system was set up, a lot of the drivers actually to push us in the direction where we go are funding drivers, and that's coming from the government. But there's also the, the pushing universities towards having more strategic planning, etc. It was a pretty sensible thing, especially as they grow and they become larger, because you do want universities to work in a way that you, you would hope that is planned. Um, uh, if you if you have a from the text of perspective the way they regulate it's more Malcolm Sparrow is the person you more want to look at and his ideas around risk based regulation I mean that's really at the core of what they're doing when they make the judgments around scholarly activity and what and the outputs I don't think it's driven by a neoliberal paradigm it's just driven by what they think is quantifiable easily quantifiable from staff who generally are fairly not that well qualified in terms of their experience from the academic side. It's a tick and flick exercise. It's what makes it easier for them. It's also driven by the people who may have written those guidance notes, whether it was Lindsay Haywood or Michael Tomlinson. There's a whole mix of, um, of aspects in there. Um, it, the, I mean, your references to the, the audit side, I do find that amusing as a former awkward auditor, but also a historian of the French Communist Party. I don't think I was ever motivated by any neoliberal paradigms when I was um, auditing universities. So um, I do, you just do have to be careful, I think, sometimes when you impute motives upon um, other people who might be doing the auditing. Um, so I think that, I think there is an important aspect as well to, um, to the, the, those sort of notions around those outputs in terms of, I can understand where they're coming from in terms of accountability, you know, universities do, have, they do get a lot of public funds and that's part of what the auditing was about too, it's, you know, making, making them accountable. But I think the last point I'd just make is it's important to, um, to disentangle what's in our profiles procedure from what TEXA is actually asking. The profile procedure ca captures stuff that's much wider and that's concerned with the institution and institutional policies. TEXA is really aimed at a baseline. And as um, Delma can attest to, we've really been from the TEXA side, what we're expecting of staff is at a, at a fairly low threshold. But from what the institution might be expecting in a scholarly um, plan is something again, and we you, you have to be careful not to um, to conflate the two because I think they're different, they're different matters. So, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if there's anyone. So we've heard from the regulatory side of the university. Um, can we hear from someone else? Um, maybe someone in the trenches. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, so coming from a, a quite a different perspective, I would say, uh, just maybe one way to approach the wicked problem is to look at open scholarship. And uh, while open scholarship doesn't have the complexity of auditing, I mean, I think it's it's come about because particularly open digital scholarship, and I'm talking like Martin Weller would describe it, uh, that's come about as perhaps a reaction to the complexity of scholarship behind the university walls or when you're, you know, you've got to declare your association. Uh, so for myself, it, open scholarship is is something that's uh, for me is a slow scholarship and it's not to do with the requirements of the university that I work, currently work with. It's more to do with how I label myself and uh, the evidence that I would show 
according to my scholarship. So it's where I'm heading and that gives me the flexibility that you were talking about. You know, how do you allow for flexibility of people's own scholarship? Uh, I do that through open scholarship. So just a comment there. Thank you, Wendy. Susan. Uh, thanks, Matt. That was a very interesting presentation. I'm a teaching scholar myself, so I'm offering a um, grassroots perspective. When I see the um, annual scholarship plan, Matt, I cringe because I, I look at the boxes and I think, oh, my gosh. How, first of all, what is scholarship of learning and teaching? At an education meeting earlier in the year, a School of Education, the question was posed and after some discussion, there was still no clear articulation of what constitutes the scholarship of learning and teaching, nor more significantly, the types of projects that we could put forth as being evidence of our engagement with this nefarious scholarship concept. Yeah. Um, and so I look at that plan and I think, how does my work fit into that plan and who are the people I can work with? Because in the School of Education, teaching, learning, it's core business for us. And yet I suspect if you were to ask lecturers whether they wanted to identify as a teaching scholar or um, research active, the teaching scholar comes off as the poor second cousin. And we just don't talk about the teaching scholar because really the gravitas um, is with the research area. And so I wonder, I kind of feel like as a teaching scholar that I work in a silo and I do my thing in teaching, but actually do I do work that's worth sharing? Does anyone else really want to know what I want, what I do? Because really what I do is just what I do. And, oh, you know, nobody else wants to really know about it. And so I think when we're given this annual scholarship plan, that's all well and good because that that puts something on paper and um, is a compliance requirement for the university. But as a lecturer who is a teaching scholar, that it just makes the whole process of engagement so much more difficult. Thank so you. They're my observational comments, Matt. Thank you. Um, I realize we're heading toward the end of our time. And Delma, I was wondering if you wanted to speak to Susan's comment, which she's in the School of Education and she does not understand what the scholarship of learning and teaching is. Could you speak to that, please? Susan, your comment makes me very sad. Um, partly because I had a meeting with your dean last week and I had already heard from other education staff about that discussion and how you, none of you could decide what the scholarship of learning and teaching was. And I had offered to present on the scholarship of learning and teaching and scholarly activity at your retreat. So that's why I'm sad. You would not be in that situation now. I think, I think in fairness to you and to our school dean, it had that discussion came on the back of what had been a discussion about research. Mm. And then so that was put to the side and then it was, well, there are others in the room who are actually teaching scholars. So in, I, I suspect it was more of an ad hoc discussion. But nonetheless, Delma, with, respectfully, people can't find the words to actually articulate what this notion of scholarship is. And, and I say that respectfully because I know you've worked hard in that space, but gra grassroots people find it hard to work out, you know, what that means. Yeah. And I see Faye nodding her head there, so I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking that my, my points resonate with someone else in the room as well. I'm going to share a document with you. It's just going to take a little bit. No, that's not the one I want. I, I might just sort of jump in from a uh, look. I, I do agree, Susan. And I mean, my school's got a very much smaller number of um, teaching scholars, but um, it, I think it is a concept that people struggle with. And um, Again, because it's not a simple thing, I don't think, and it's not one thing, it's many things. 
things. And um, and certainly in your school, I agree. It it sort of it'd be sort of I don't know like engineers trying to work out what engineering or you know I, I don't know that the teacher the teachers have more trouble with this I think than anybody else in a way because it's actually what is the difference between scholarly activity and research I kind of get that so it's taking a while to find my document unfortunately <laughs> um Matt can I I <laughs> comment then sure so I agree with everything um, Susan said and same as her, I'm a teaching scholar. Um, the, the challenge that I've had in addition to everything Susan um, has said is then trying to go up uh, to get a promotion, you have to have the publications and they have to be good publications. So that is another cross section of the marrying up because you know, yes we still have, still have to have less but unless you've done the research and done the publishing yeah. So. Can, can I just sort of jump in there, Miriam? I'm actually on the promotions committee and I have seen a number of teaching scholars get promoted. I've actually had people come to me, uh, you know, from my own school saying, oh, I advise anyone who reports to me not to be a teaching scholar because you'll never get promoted. And can I just say that's actually not true because um, a number of teaching scholars have been promoted and... I think the thing that in my school people struggle with in that space is that in order to get promotion as a teaching scholar, you've got to be able to tell a story. You've got to, you've got to have you've got to be able to have narrative. And in my school, people aren't very good at that, frankly. Um, so I think that's, as I say, I think that is that's a misconception by a lot of people that you can't be promoted as a teaching scholar. That you have to have publications. You don't have to have publications. Although you need to be showing how you're engaging with, and and I think the other thing that people do get a little bit confused about, certainly I was confused as well for me, for a long time, was you know that I'm doing really good teaching practice, so therefore I'm engaging in scholarly activities. It, it's sort of it's got to be a bit more than that. You've got to be sharing that with others and um, so forth. So anyway, um, sorry, Delma, back to you. Faye, it was really useful to have you say that from, excuse me a minute, from your point of view, the lights went out. Um, I must be sitting too still. Um, yes, and last year there were in fact three people at CQU promoted to associate professor level as teaching scholars. So perhaps what we need is professional development on how to get promoted as a teaching scholar. And maybe we need to have greater discussions around what, it, what scholarship is and where it's going. So I've shared with you a short document, a very fairly concise document I've written about scholarship at CQU. And um, it's, it's, um, it's a longer conversation we need to have, but really I have approached the deans and, I, and said, I'm happy to come and talk to your staff and haven't been invited to too many meetings yet, but if you're having a retreat or you're having a planning day and you want me to come along or we'll Zoom in, I'm happy to do it. And I know um, Sandy's there from nursing and I did present to nursing very early on the piece and we got some big relieved sighs afterwards. Oh, is that what we're talking about? Would you agree with that, Sandy? Uh, yes, Dilma, I would. I find this whole thing to be all really very confusing and um, I find that I probably like a lot of people when you actually go to discuss it with people to get a better handle on what it is that you're supposed to be doing with that form you tell I just fill it, just fill it out and send it to me, which mm. um, I found very, very difficult. And I have to agree with the comments that if you're not heavily into research, you really are considered, a, you know, the, the poor cousin. Um, whereas us teaching scholars, I think what we're doing is quite valuable. I'll get off can, I, can I take this opportunity to recommend to you to the keynote speaker tomorrow, who has done a sector-wide analysis of teaching versus research and the importance of it. So Pauline's not in the room with me at the moment. She's actually next door in another office. And she will be talking about that and those impressions sector-wide. Matt, sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no problem. I just, uh, just to, to uh, you, uh, uh, Jason and Delma, you probably already know this, but just, just pointing out the conversation we've had for the last 10 minutes in terms of capturing scholarly activity and in terms of the scholarship of learning and teaching, um, there's great confusion. And um, 
And yes, there's really good work being done, but gathering up those sticks and specs about what the, how to see that scholarship as something that can be counted beyond the narrative that Faye was saying is I think a really important thing. And I think that is it for me. So thank you, Delma, for uh, giving me this time to chat. Um, does anybody else want to bring up some things maybe from the first two presentations? You might see in the chat that we've just talked about 23 things of, of um, SOTL or SALT as we call it at CQU. And I was thinking about 23 things for vet transitioning students. I, I just thank everybody. I, they were great sessions. Thank you. Thanks, Faye. And I'd reiterate, reiterate that. So anyone who doesn't know, we're applauding in sign language. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>